In this module, we're going to talk about what we call X-ray diffractometry. So we've been talking a lot about the um, act of diffraction and so forth, but today we want to basically move into the instrumentation and how it's actually done. So X-ray diffractometry, or XRD, as we've been calling it, um, is the most widely used type of x-ray diffraction technique. There are multiple techniques, uh, but this is uh, the one that we typically do. And so it's typically done on powder samples, but we can also do other uh, examples as well. So polycrystalline aggregates, we can do uh, bulk materials and so forth, but powders are very common. And so the instrument is called an X-ray diffractometer. So pretty simple in terms of its name, uh, X-ray diffractometer. Um, for this, we have a single wavelength, what we call monochromatic, right? Just what we talked about uh, to examine these polycrystalline samples. Um, we also have uh, another thing that we typically do is continuously change or scan uh, the incident beam. So we're changing uh, or scanning the incident beam angle, so that Bragg angle that we've talked about. And what we do is we record the spectrum because we're getting um, values from a number of different angles. So we record that spectrum uh, of the diffracted intensity. So we only have the detector set up at the same angle as what the incident beam is, just like we saw with the Bragg geometry. So we're recording the intensity as a function of angle. And what we do is we take these spectra and we compare to databases of known materials. So we compare those spectra to databases that can contain thousands or tens of thousands of samples of these known crystalline specimens, and that's how we determine what our materials are. So the geometry is very much related to what we saw in Bra uh, Bragg's Law, and so for most diffractometers, Uh, use what's called Bragg uh, Rentino geometry. So it's kind of an extension of Bragg's geometry, but specifically for how most machines actually do this type um, of experiment. And so this is going to be shown in figure. 215 in your textbook, and I'll actually switch over here in a second and show you uh, this geometry, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. Okay, so here's the, the geometric uh, arrangement of a typical X-ray diffractometer using this Bragg uh, Brentano uh, geometry. And so a couple things to kind of note about this is that the geometry requires that the diffracting planes of the sample uh, should be parallel to the sample stage here. That way the configuration uh, of uh, theta, the angle, works out. So that also means that, that, that it should, the diffracting planes should be parallel to the sample surface. There are occasions where this may not occur, uh, but they should be parallel to the sample stage at the very least. Okay, so let's run through 
this arrangement uh, and just kind of talk about the various components. So this should look very similar to Bragg's Law and what we talked about there. We have a sample here and then um, the source of the x-rays, the incident beams uh, coming here onto the specimen at an angle theta and then the detector up here at the same angle theta. What's different is the arrangement and how that um, geometry is maintained. So in most systems, the x-ray tube that you see here is fixed in position. So it does not move. So this is fixed. Uh, this portion of the uh, machine is fixed. Um, so basically that radiation that comes off the tube, and we've talked a little bit about the tube, um, goes through what we call um, solar slits. These slits are basically special metal slits uh, that uh, collimate the beam. So basically they make it parallel. And so this reduces any beam divergence that we have sort of uh, perpendicular to the setting. So I can actually, if I move sort of ahead, you can kind of see a better view of what these solar slits are. So we have a set here um, after the x-ray source. And basically these prevent any divergence uh, in the, the perpendicular direction to the, uh, the, the plane. So that's kind of step, um, that's the first por portion of the diagram. So we have these solar slits that reduces divergence in the direction perpendicular to the figure. Okay, so once that occurs, once it goes through the solar slits, then it reaches the specimen. Uh, this divergent beam uh, reaches the specimen and the angle between the beam and the specimen is theta. So this angle here is the same as, as over here. So that's important. So this specimen uh, is usually in the form of a flat plate. And so if I kind of skip ahead here, um, a couple ways we can do this um, is we can, uh, sometimes we have a, um, a plate with a cavity in it and we fill that cavity with a powder and then we basically use some type of flat surface like or flat uh, flat thing like a razor blade or a glass slide and we basically uh, strike that away and make the top surface parallel to the sample holder. Um, so, so somehow we have to get that um, flat uh, and we want it to be um, in line or, or planar with the top surface here. Okay. So now if we kind of go back to the original drawing, so um, at that point it goes through the specimen and um, the beam that is diffracted will head towards, uh, this is now um, a convergent beam as opposed to the divergent beam here, and it will go towards the detector. But again, before it goes there, we have a second set of these solar slits, which have the same uh, function as they uh, basically uh, make this more uh, collinear uh, in w with the beam. And so um, it goes through uh, that set of solar slits, sometimes are called re uh, receiving slits. Okay. So after that, we have a we have the diffracted beam, um, and at that point, uh, it also will pass through a filter. So you see here um, what we see as a monochromator, and as it sounds, it's trying to get a single wavelength. So if we have multiple wavelengths present, this is eliminating that uh, material. So this is basically a filter which suppresses the wavelengths other than the one we want. And so that's typically the K alpha. And this is used to reduce the background. And if I skip ahead here, I can show you a little bit more specifically what this tends to, uh, to look like. So we had the receiving slits and then the monochromator is basically this whole thing here. 
And in this case, what the monochromator is, is a piece of graphite. So a very well-defined uh, crystalline material, uh, single crystalline material. So it diffracts at a very specific angle. And so basically the beam coming in goes through another kind of Bragg experiment, right? It's going in an angle theta and coming out at the same if it's diffracted. So we have this set up uh, with a graphite crystal um, such that only the um, specific wavelength will diffract and go towards the detector. So uh, we have it set up such that it will always diffract for that given wavelength. But if you have, for example, K alpha beta, or sorry, K um, K beta wavelength, um, then that would uh, diffract at a different angle and it's not going to go to the detector. So this is just one extra step we take to reduce other um, signal through an additional diffraction experiment, basically. Uh, so that's one way we can do, um, we can monochromate the material. So if I go back now to the general setup here, um, is the receiving slits, the monochromator, and the detector are all kind of part of one apparatus. Uh, so it's all kind of grouped together. And the reason it's done that is because it is hooked up to what we call uh, this, you know, what it's calling here a measuring circle. And that what that does is it moves these components at an angle of two theta with respect to the electron tube. By doing that and moving the sample at an angle theta, and then this assembly up here at two theta, it maintains the theta theta geometry that we expect from Bragg's law. So this whole assembly moves by two theta, and that's why uh, when we get to the actual data, we'll see that it's often terms in terms of two theta because the goniometer, which is measuring that angle two theta, uh, has the units of two theta, not theta, because it's recording how much the detector assembly has uh, has to move. So that's why you see that uh, oftentimes. So that's kind of the overall assembly. So with Bragg's law, it tells us the general relationship between the incident beam, the diffracted beam, and the sample. And then this bragg uh, Bertano geometry tells us how a typical X-ray diffractometer actually makes that geometry possible. And that's by keeping the electron, or sorry, the uh, X-ray tube fixed, moving the sample by theta, and moving the detector assembly by two theta. So that's important to, to keep in mind when we're looking at uh, experimental data. All right, one last sort of technical note here is the angle that we see, theta, is technically the angle between the incident beam and the crystallographic plane in the specimen that generates diffraction. So in most cases, this is the same as the, uh, the sample uh, surface. Um, it's because the sample surface is parallel to the diffracting plane. But if there are some issues with that specimen being flat or um, in plane with the top surface, then there could be some issues uh, with that. So, but just technically speaking, um, the angle that we're measuring is between the incident beam and the diffracting crystallographic plane. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, with this geometry. Okay, so now that we're uh, kind of, we've talked some about this geometry here, what I want you to do is think about some of the implications that come along with uh, the XRD geometry only detecting crystallographic planes parallel to the sample surface. So this is going to be on your quiz, but see if you can come up with some implications of uh, the X-ray diffraction geometry only detecting crystallographic planes parallel to the sample surface. Come back and we'll talk about the, the next section.